ações do Brasil e do exterior, reconhecidas como referências na área de segurança cibernética. Confira a programação completa em nosso site www.gov.br barra CETIR. Para a abertura oficial do nosso 12º colóquio CETIR GOV 2022, convido e passo a palavra ao excelentíssimo senhor ministro-chefe do Gabinete de Segurança Institucional da Presidência da República, General Augusto Heleno. A minha saudação a todos. Eu agradeço a presença de todos os senhores participantes do 12º Colóquio de Segurança Cibernética e, em especial, quero agradecer aos representantes de Nações Amigas a participação, porque isso abrilhanta muito o nosso evento e traz para esse encontro as experiências que são vividas pelos senhores também nesse tema segurança cibernética, que realmente é um tema que está preocupando e mobilizando praticamente toda a humanidade. Sem dúvidas, é um tema cuja preocupação mundial já mostra o seu valor, a sua importância ou a sua relevância no mundo de hoje. Com isso, nós esperamos que este ano de 2022 nós tenhamos nesse campo muitas realizações e principalmente ações colaborativas, porque ninguém consegue sobreviver sozinho num campo tão restrito em termos de conhecimento. Ainda o mundo está engatinhando nesse aspecto. Nós ainda temos muito receio das ações externas aos sistemas que nos trazem sérios problemas e temos necessidade exatamente de trocar conhecimento, de fazer com que o que for sendo testado e aprovado em outras nações seja contado a todos que estão participando dessa atividade. Esse coloque tem a finalidade de fazer exatamente esse intercâmbio entre os órgãos nacionais e internacionais, apresentando temas relevantes relacionados com segurança cibernética e voltado para as infraestruturas críticas. E, além disso, já comentei, fomentar a troca de informações em assuntos relacionados à gestão de incidentes cibernéticos nessas infraestruturas críticas. A Rede Federal de Gestão de Incidentes Cibernéticas tem avançado bastante, considerando a formalização por decreto, em 2021, dessa Rede Federal de Gestão de Incidentes. A REGIC, que permite a outras instituições fora da administração pública federal pleitear a adesão à rede. Esse decreto trouxe como grande inovação a concepção de coordenação setorial de incidentes que contribui de forma inequívoca para a segurança das infraestruturas críticas. Aproveito para reiterar meu agradecimento a todos pelo interesse, pelo trabalho colaborativo e pelos esforços em prol de um espaço cibernético mais seguro e resiliente para toda a sociedade. Desejo que este coloque seja proveitoso, como de praxe, e estreite ainda mais a cooperação entre nossas instituições. Um ótimo colóquio a todos. Meu bom dia. Para alguns, boa tarde. Para alguns, talvez, boa noite. Mas nós estamos juntos aí nesse trabalho altamente significativo para o mundo de hoje. O Brasil é um país continental, cuja sociedade necessita de uma vasta gama de serviços resilientes e de qualidade. A energia elétrica representa uma dessas demandas. A primeira apresentação 
trata deste setor tão caro à nossa população. E será realizada pelo senhor Paulo Henrique da Rosa Benítez, representando a Itaipu Binacional, uma das maiores infraestruturas da América Latina. O título de sua apresentação será o Panorama Atual e Futuro de Segurança Cibernética no Ambiente de Tecnologia da Automação, TA, da Itaipu Binacional. Passo a palavra ao senhor Paulo Benítez. Bom dia a todos. Eu vou iniciar minha apresentação. Bom, é... a ideia aqui, essa apresentação foi feita por mim e por mais dois colegas, então aqui o Carlos Bueno e o Pedro Paulo. E ela trata especificamente do panorama qual o futuro da segurança cibernética no ambiente de TA, que é responsabilidade na Itaipu Nacional da diretoria técnica. Nossa agenda vai ser realizada em três pontos, os conceitos de segurança cibernética, o panorama da diretoria técnica, baseado em, três, em pilares de atuação, a situação atual e futura e as conclusões. Iniciando pelos conceitos de segurança cibernética, é uma breve introdução. É, basicamente, a segurança da informação é composta por confidencialidade, integridade e disponibilidade. Então, essas são os, as propriedades básicas da segurança da informação. E aqui já começa uma pequena diferença entre a TI, a rede corporativa na Itaipu Nacional, e a TA, é a rede industrial. A prioridade para a TA, para a rede industrial, do ponto de vista da segurança de informação, é a disponibilidade. E para a TI, na rede corporativa, é a confidencialidade. Mas todos os três itens são importantes. Então, aqui é, 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 cabe ressaltar a diferença entre esses dois ambientes, a TI e a TA, do ponto de vista da Itaipu Nacional. É, como a gente pode ver aqui no item TI, nós temos os três... Os, os três itens, as três propriedades, a confidencialidade, a integridade e a disponibilidade, na, numa ordem de prioridade. Comparando com a TA, também temos a disponibilidade, a integridade e a confidencialidade. E aqui a, aparece a prioridade é, para os dois ambientes da segurança da informação. Outra característica interessante, que de modo geral, não é 100% do tempo, mas de modo geral, as aplicações de TI... Elas são aplicações que não são de tempo real. E também, de modo geral, as aplicações de TA são aplicações que é, exigem tempo real. Alguns exemplos de aplicações de TI é o SAP, o e-mail, a intranet. Tá? Um e-mail, por exemplo, se ele levar alguns minutos adicionais para é, chegar ao destinatário, não vai ter uma influência muito grande. É, já do ponto de vista de TA, que a escada é a produção é, hidroenergética. Se houver um atraso, por exemplo, num um sinal de disparo de um disjuntor, isso pode significar um, um relé, isso pode significar a queima do equipamento, do um disjuntor, um, um risco potencial aos equipamentos e à vida humana. É, a título de exemplo, né, nós temos aqui a intranet da Itaipu, que é a responsabilidade da TI, e temos um, um, uma tela do nosso SCADA, é, utilizada aqui na Itaipu, como exemplo de TA. Lembrando que existe uma intersecção e uma comunicação entre esses ambientes, que deve ser bem protegida e bem é, segmentada. Isso a gente vai apresentar na sequência também. Vou chegar a comentar sobre esse assunto. Bom, do ponto de vista da relevância, então, da segurança cibernética, né, porque na diretoria técnica isso é importante, três itens ressaltam. Né, a, a segurança operacional e da geração de energia é fundamental. E aí vem a questão da disponibilidade, é, a proteção dos ativos das pessoas do meio ambiente 
e monitoramento, prevenção, detecção e rápida resposta em momentos de incidentes também é muito importante. E esse tema, ele vem sido, tem sido tratado dentro da diretoria técnica desde a implantação dos primeiros sistemas digitais, é, lá no início dos anos 2000, quando o prim primeiro sistema escada entrou em, em operação. É, eu falei várias vezes sobre escada, a audiência aqui não precisa ficar preocupado que eu vou detalhar um pouquinho mais adiante no, na apresentação. Outro motivo da preocupação com o assunto de segurança cibernética é o aumento da quantidade de incidentes de segurança cibernética que tem ocorrido nos últimos anos e mais recentemente voltados especificamente para infraestruturas críticas. É, eu não peguei detalhes os mais antigos, peguei alguns mais recentes, como o que aconteceu em 2015, atacando a rede da, da Ucrânia, né, a rede de energia, um ataque começou com phishing e deixou indisponível é, energia elétrica para uma grande quantidade de pessoas no, em pleno inverno no Hemisfério Norte. É, em 2017, tivemos aquele ataque de escala global do WannaCry, que também afetou, foi um ataque mundial, é, a qual, felizmente, nós passamos em columns, e tem um motivo, também a gente vai entrar nesse detalhe. É, outro incidente que a gente pensou, dentre os diversos que já ocorreram, é o ataque ao oleoduto é, dos Estados Unidos, do Colonial Pipe, já em 2021. E o ataque de negação de serviço de DDoS em Porto Rico em 2021 também. Então, isso, esse, esse grande crescimento, com alguns poucos exemplos que eu apresentei, já é motivo suficiente para a gente estar bastante preocupado com esse assunto dentro da Itaipu e dentro da diretoria técnica. Entrando especificamente agora no panorama da diretoria técnica, é, é interessante comentar que, é, especificamente sobre Itaipu e mais genericamente outras infraestruturas críticas, devem estar na mesma situação, nós tínhamos uma estrutura analógica, que está presente desde a é, construção da usina, e que ainda está funcional, e... Desde que a usina começou, desde o início de 2000, nós estamos atravessando uma, uma modificação, uma mudança lenta, gradual para uma estrutura digital. Ou seja, os equipamentos antigos estão sendo substituídos por equipamentos novos, que não são mais eletromecânicos, são digitais. Isso também causa um aumento na superfície de ataque. É, por quê? Porque... Os equipamentos analógicos, o único modo de, de serem. Uh, can comandado. only be attacked and commanded locally. And the digital equipment um, is, is controllable remotely. It is good to remind you of an important topic that we have been uh, updating right now in terms of the technology in Itaipu is a process of uh, incrementation of the, the increase of the change, the, the pace of the change. Uh, and we will even uh, deactivate many of the panels that we have, the analog panels that we have nowadays. One example here, you have the left side pictures. They are all uh, going to disappear. So this is an increase of the attack surface. But it is nice to remember that this has been considered also a part of the plan of the technological revolution. And I will talk more about that later. So, uh, basically, in general, this entire presentation will be uh, divided into what we have done in the past and what we are going to still do from now on, with the focus of uh, updating the technology uh, in order to update the entire power plant, which has begun already, and this is going to take place for a while now. I, the idea here is to focus on the three pillars based in people, technology, and processes. These pillars are the pillars of the management of knowledge, knowledge that we uh, take advantage of in order to work with cybersecurity. In general, people, uh, personnel would be included, uh, people who should be trained and be kept training. Uh, technology is the investment in technology, and the processes is 
the uh, update, renewal, and evolution of processes involved involved in order to contemplate that development and keep people with capacity to deal with their uh, mission, with the optimal uh, development of their new reality. Specifically talking about the training personnel, we have uh, professionals that took part in the uh, SMA 2443, uh, standards for cybersecurity and environment and AT environments. We had many uh, employers, employees that uh, took that course. And we did that in order to uh, commit to those two certifications. So we have two teams certificated by with certification in level one and two. We had also the participation in many uh, training sessions. Uh, one of them has been uh, done by PUC. Um, we have the technologies of the 4.0 industry, the IT safe uh, for industrial automation security, and CERT.PR, which is the fundamentals of incident handling, advanced topics, and the overview of creating and managing computing, computer security incident response teams. Also, uh, talking about training, we have a, an agreement with the Brazilian Army, and it allows us to take part in the Network Academy of Cisco. This is uh, some training offered by Cisco. This is the platform that they use uh, to integrate. And here we have three trainings that we took with the introduction to cybersecurity, cybersecurity essentials, and network security, also known as CCNA security. And this, uh, we took advantage to also have other trainings too, not only those. So as the topic is cybersecurity, I was just mentioning those related to it. Um, this partnership is, in, uh, is mediated by uh, CPTI, and this has been very beneficial to increase the development and, and training of the teams. And since we are mentioning um, this uh, team of uh, BTI is uh, we also have a partnership with the army that allows us to uh, have other trainings uh, going on as well, just like ISO 27,000 27, and uh, also uh, offensive safety and digital forensics and response to incidents. Everything with the Taipu and the Brazilian army. From a point of view of personnel, what we intend to do in our path forward we want to keep certificating and expand that to more employers because employees because that is the uh, 62443 uh, certification has is a prerequisite that the Taipu themselves have demanded for um, technological updates so the professionals that that got the procurement should be uh, certified with this norm and so the idea is to uh, to have within the technical board more and more employees having certifications in this norm. So um, they are also taking part in the training for uh, specialization in cybersecurity by UF, UTFPR, the Technological University of the, of the State of Paraná, and also Senai uh, Cybersecurity for the Electric Sector, a executive formation that will uh, executive training that will help with this topic as well. The idea is also to keep going with this partnership with the FPTI Foundation and with the Army in order to use to keep using the training in the, of the uh, Network Academy, which has been very fruitful. And uh, in terms of processes, I would like to briefly comment about the uh, evolution of the cybersecurity policy within Itaipu that started way back in the past with the uh, uh, basic directive definitions. And then we had a uh, CST, which is the union of IT, telecommunications, and AT. Right afterwards, we had the structuring of the policies for safety of information. In, ITC and then the manual for safety in uh, IT using. So this is for the institution in the institutional level. 
in terms of IT, we of AT, we have the uh, manual, the technical manual for AT. And here we know just as the norms and we have proved that manual. And currently we are creating the instructions and procedures for the technicians in AT. Another very important item for our work in terms of uh, processes is the collaboration with um, work groups and entities, both internal and external. The main ones that we have externally are the, uh, the ones that we work with are, are, is Abrace, the Brazilian Association of the Electric Transmission Companies, Abrace, the Brazilian Association of uh, energy generating companies, CETOI, which is the committee for uh, technical uh, operation technology in the Eletrobras. We have Brasier, the Brazilian Commission for the Energetic Region Integration. We also took place, took part of the uh, training for Cybernetic Guardian 3.0 and then 2.0 was, uh, it was, it has been uh, adjourned because of the pandemic. Um, one detail that I miss maybe is that, uh, that the Setoi Commission for Operational Technology, this is the most specific part of the um, AT itself. But for Itaipu, it has the same meaning when we speak about the operational technology. And within Itaipu, we always uh, use the terms uh, IT is uh, AT is equal to OT. So, um, Automation technology is the same as operation technology in within Itaipu. So the uh, regarding the internal groups, we have the uh, Commission for Information Safety Technology in, in and Information and Technology of Information Technology in Automation and Telecommunication, the Strategic Commission for Safety of Information, SASI. Within the operation, we created the internal committee for response to incidents in the operation that was right after the uh, WannaCry uh, incident in 2017. And it was very fruitful just uh, because then we, we created the instructions for specific operations in, in cases of uh, uh, cyber security incidents, which is EOP 47, because because they uh, we have some rules that we had to simulate some attacks in order to check if the actions that we had as instructions should be feasible and executable and if we might have any mistakes over there so we we took some simulations and also we created the csta the technical uh, permanent security committee for at we have professionals from the entire technical board and many superintendents in, in, in Brazil and Paraguay participating in that entity. And what we intend to keep doing in terms of the processes, uh, as I said, we have approved the technical norms for, I, for AT, um, automation technology, and now we want to keep approving and elaborating the procedures to the technicians. So here it shows a little bit of what I, I spoke before about the norms for IT, telecom, and AT. So reminding you again that we in, within Itaipu, we also have uh, automation technology is the same as operation technology. From the point of view of technology, we uh, what we are doing now is uh, we have this scale that we are using, which is the SIS control and data acquisition. It is just a, a, a SCADA system. It, it is a, a, a generic name in supervision of controls. The current SCADA system has been uh, reviewed. This is a screen of the system showing up here. In this modernization process, we had uh, required some improvements in terms of uh, compared to the previous version. So one of them is the monitoring of the network. We included a software to um, to have that function going. We also uh, required the isolated test environment. So we have a, a test environment that would replicate our production environment and it can be totally isolated from the productive network and the other networks with many uh, goals for testing, um, including destructive testing with no risk to the productive environment. 
Another improvement is that the access points are now individualized and the, uh, the network has been segregated. Our SCADA system has, just to give you a general view of it and what it represents in the power plant, is, gen is controlling the generation of the 20 generating units of the uh, gas uh, substation, the isolated gas substation, the GIS, and the, uh, the spillway, which is the, where the, one of the main systems. So this is the system that controls it all. Another safety item, item that we uh, have available within the technical board is the uh, CD, the Integrated System for Industrial Networks. So coming back to that division between eight we have the automation uh, network and uh, of course we have communication and we have protection so each one of those networks has a firewall and they have specific rules for restricting communication between those two environments which um, it's, it's nice to make clear that nowadays it is paramount to transfer information between one side and the other um, in order to update not only the managing uh, updates, but also for the entities, just like the National Water Agency and uh, WHO and ANEL and many others. The city network is uh, gathering all of the networks for automation or operational technology, which are part of the environment and under the responsibility of the the technical board so and this network is used is used as an additional layer of protection because all of the communications between those two environments and the, the industrial environment which is including a SCADA system here and many other systems that are part of the industrial uh, environment should go through the city network so this is an advantage uh, one more advantage because we are linked directly to the we are not linked directly to the corporate network because we have a, a filter system between those two environments which is one more layer of protection another advantage is the centralization of the uh, industrial networks uh, industrial network connections all of the information goes through there we have the access control and the traffic control of all information that goes through and also, uh, we also have in uh, identifying this system working with identifying uh, threats and monitoring the um, and supervising the communication, specifically about the supervision and monitoring of the network. In addition to Siri network, we have a project now, a pilot project that is being developed right now of uh, more detail. Uh, detailed monitoring in our AT environment. So this is, the idea is to uh, identify the common behaviors of the devices, the network traffic, and also identifying vulnerabilities. From, for the future, what we want to do in terms of technology, I, I should mention the technological, um, the tech, um, update it is a massive update of digitalization basically all of the panels that we have the analog panels that we have for supervision and control all of them or almost all of them will be substituted uh, they will be replaced and this as i said before increases the surface or attack because that would be a higher level of access and the analog system will uh, no longer exist it will be replaced by another which is completely digital and since we already know that and we are aware of it in in the planning of uh, the project for update we identified some specific points and we foresee the cybersecurity as a key factor for success so basically from the point of view of protection and what we have uh, for the future we have safer uh, rooms for the workers, so they will be in the AT environment, they will be uh, for the servers, will be in safe rooms. They are some of those rooms that you have no humans in, 
so they are a cold environment, a fireproof environment, and very robust walls. And the operations will be done externally. So you have a key and you have the control for access for specific activities. But that is an improvement that we already have a um, plan for. And then we also have firewalls for IDS, intrusion detection system, and IPS, intrusion prevention system. We also have new environments with uh, tests for isolation of the network. And this is going to expand to other environments as well in within the AT network. Also, we are trying to have more new equipment for transmission, uh, unidirectional transmission of information. So with that, we will significantly uh, increase the security of uh, transmission of information, for instance, for the corporate network. So this is one of the uh, things that we want to do in terms of protection. In terms of detection, we uh, have improved monitoring networks and uh, threat control and identification solutions already uh, within the equipment that we are acquiring right now. In terms of responses, we will have new controls for redundant uh, controlling system because nowadays our redundancy is conventional with the analog systems and they will no longer exist soon. We have local control system and um, alternative uh, an alternative room for control, which is used for emergencies uh, with all kinds of problems, since, uh, just like we did recently with the pandemic. So during the pandemic, it was necessary to change the, the teams for uh, into a alternative, uh, a different control room. And that is now in the plan now. And the specification is contemplating all of that that was mentioned in this slide. Well, I presented um, the panorams for the, the, the overall picture for the three pillars, and now we will have the conclusions, and I will briefly uh, summarize. In general, the pillars are the people, the, the personnel, the processes, and the technology. And from the personnel point of view, we have the training and the updated, updated training that we have today. In the future, we want to keep certificating and expanding in training and also increasing certification that has been demanded with the uh, technological update. And the idea is to update everybody all the time. From the point of view of processes, we have the norms, uh, created norms. Uh, we have the participation of commissions, both internally and externally. And we also have the uh, manual for response to incidents in 2017. In the future, we will elaborate and approve the instructions for procedures and the uh, instructions for services regarding the uh, procedures in, and their instructions. From the point of view of technology, we have now the SCADA network. We have the safety of the Siri network as well, the additional layer of safety that we have between IT and AT. We have the monitoring that is still partial in the AT network and the possibility of operating in a conventional analog control. So if you lack the SCAD, the, the SCADA system, you will still have that possibility. In the future, we won't have that possibility anymore, but fortunately, we will have more uh, uh, updated uh, solutions for cybersecurity and the full monitoring of the AT network and the redundancies of digital controls, which will be the main control and a redundant secondary uh, digital control that will be used during the failure of the main control. That will be the substitution and replacement of the analog system that we have nowadays. This is what I had to present to you. And uh, this, is, uh, this is all. I appreciate you all. Thank you, Mr. Paulo Benitez, for your presentation in our 12th colloquium. I will inform you that uh, the questions will be should be sent via chat box and they will be sent to the lecturers after and after they answer they will make them the responses available in the website www.gov.br slash ctir. Foundation. 
Itaipu, Brazil, BTIBR, manages an ecosystem of innovation which promotes the synergy and exchange of knowledge for the development of solutions for society. The second presentation will be made by Mr. Rafael José Leitos, representing the PTIBR Foundation. The title of his presentation will be Cybersecurity Solutions for Automation. I pass the floor to Mr. Rafael Dentis. Good morning, everyone. I've already been introduced. My name is Rafael Datos. Currently, I am the technical director of the Fundação Parque Tecnológico Itaipu, the abbreviation is PTI. I'll be calling it PTI for now on to make things easier. First of all, I'd like to thank those who invited me and say it's an honor to represent PTI here at this event. The idea today is a conversation, sharing with you a little bit of what PTI has been doing in terms of cybersecurity aimed at automation, especially looking at the power sector, which is the sector our maintaining company type of International, our, who is also a client and partner, and um, that's where their needs are, and that's where a lot of our work is. So I'll be talking about that. So the order of my presentation is this. I'm going to talk first a little bit about the technological um, area, and so I can talk about its dimensions and how we relate with automation ecosystems, especially our ICT, which is our Institution of Technology and Science. And then I'm going to give you some context talking about uh, cybersecurity and information technology. And number three, I'll be talking about two relevant solutions. At PTI, we offer some uh, solutions given by our partners. And lately, I'm going to talk about some prospects and joint solutions, last of all. So, the Itaipu Technological Center. So as a technological center, we have a mission. The foundation manages the technical center and part of our mission is to manage this technological center. But I would like to talk about the part of the mission that has a lot to do with technology, which is the mission of um, managing and promoting technology to generate well-being for society. That's our big client. So we have to look at the intellectual capital we have in our park and transform this knowledge, transform the technologies in solutions that really reach the needs of society. In general, we work in four theme areas agribusiness, uh, power, security of critical infrastructure, tourism and cities. So uh, cybersecurity is under the umbrella of security of critical infrastructures. That's our topic today, related of course to the issue of power since we're related to a type of national, which is a power company here. To give you some context about the foundation, on the left corner, we can see our four final processes. And this is just to give you a dimension of what the Technological Park Foundation does. But I want to talk about the development of technological solutions. I want to focus on that. 
because that's reflected in our concept of our ICT. We have an ICT inside the foundation. It's divided hierarchically into seven centers that perform projects. And one of them that I'm going to talk about is the one related to cybersecurity work. In terms of numbers, we have about 560 collaborators in our institution as a whole. Just in the ICT, the cybersecurity area, we have about 30 people. We have uh, the size of our institution is about 75.54 hectares. And we have three universities in our technological center. That's very positive for us. That brings us intellectual capital to make our systems more dynamic. We have a public federal university, a state university, and a municipal university. We have equipped companies. We have partners. We have outsourced collaborators. All of this together materialize the concept of the tree helix that in essence is something that we use in the idea of a technological center. So it's academia, public and private sector working together with well-aligned objectives. Here I have a little bit of our uh, project portfolio in our technological center. I'm going to focus a lot on the ICT and the actions in our portfolio and our science and technology institution, that's ICT. So we have different relationship with different actors. We have some contracts and agreements and 67 instruments that uh, in total contain approximately 90 concomitant projects. Uh, with an investment of approximately 300 million reals by partners into these projects. Some examples of solutions. We have uh, research and development projects, automation solutions, essays. We use an equipment for simulation of uh, power and technical consultancy. And to complement, what are our sources of funding? So as a technological park, ICT works in this technological center, capturing projects from the private and the um, public sector, like companies like Anel. We have direct contracts with the public and private sector. So looking at por our portfolio today, 70% of the projects approximately are focused on research and development, trying to create innovative solutions, always responding to our clients. And on the right, we have a brief representation of our objective of positioning our Institution of Science and Technology, CTPI, as a reference in the national scenario. And for this, we work with partners and partners throughout Brazil with no distinction. Here in the state of Paraná in the South region, it's more dense, but our goal is always to offer our solutions, our know-how, our expertise to be used uh, to respond to needs of clients wherever they are. Well, our division of the institution is the fruit of your organization. We organize ourselves in competency centers, and this is a general overview, then we'll focus on our topic today. I want to show you that one of these competency sectors is number seven, that's cybersecurity. And this center brings together uh, several competencies, people and actions aimed at cybersecurity. And that's our idea here, to share ideas about that. And they're on the base and the 
lower part of the image, you can see some of our clients. You can see that most of them are in the power sector. And uh, this has to do with the fact that we began serving a uh, type national. So cybersecurity, technology and automation and focus. I'll be talking about some things that might have been mentioned already. I'll go over it briefly, but I think it's important to talk about this because it brings a little bit of the context and they'll make sense later on. So I'm not gonna to take too long in the items, but we started in 2010 and uh, because of a relevant event, an attack of uh, uh, malware, the Stuxnet. This was very well known. This was maybe the first at attack to critical infrastructure that was openly publicized. And so I want to talk about these attacks that generate the context about how our Center for Studies of Cybersecurity began. And so it's important to point out that the attacks here that I'm pointing out here are some choice chosen attacks, but there were probably many others that were not publicized. And over time, over the years, we've noticed there's been an intensification in the amount of attacks. And I'd also say the quality of the attacks or the capacity to interrupt services, the degree of relevance of this type of event. So we had Stuxnet in 2010 and then it evolved. We heard comments in the former visualization 2020, 2021, we had attacks. And what we see is increase in interest in creating mechanisms, creating solutions, and malwares that, in essence, attack critical infrastructure, considering their relevance for countries and companies. As was said, this was last year, was perhaps one of the most recent that was publicized globally. But in this specific case, at least, we see two areas of action. The first one was interrupting the operation of the critical infrastructure. So they were no longer able to respond uh, to supply the East Coast in the US and they were responsible for 40% of the supply. So it's very relevant. But along with this was uh, the theft of a lot of information about the company. And we know that's very valuable too. And it's also behind this type of attack that we've been seeing. So this is just to reinforce what's being said. We talk a lot about this, how the exposure of companies has increased, how risks have increased. And this makes us more and more concerned about this type of action. I'm also bringing here, I spoke a little bit about the private sector and what's happening there. And another aspect I wanna talk about is how the people, the government have been looking at this, what position they've been taking. So there are several, uh, publications and decrees, but essentially the Brazilian government has done a diagnosis and has a vision of what's going on. It's a real scenario where the companies are more and more connected and cybersecurity of uh, critical infrastructures is a relevant element. There are many types of threats, vulnerabilities appear every year with threats coming along. And the government has shown us a direction and strategic action so actors can take a stance and seek a path, essentially to increase the level of security of infrastructures. 
I brought here uh, two different lessons that were made. These were founded on the Constitution of Tears. For example, one of the cases is the cybernetic guardian. And the second one is encouraging the creation of new solutions, innovative solutions in cybersecurity. And this has a great synergy with what we're doing in the Technological Center through our development center, a center that develops solutions for cybersecurity. In essence, we're very much connected uh, to the vision. Só para passar o and this um, subject. In the end of 2020, we had the national strategy of uh, security for in physical structures. That's very much connected to physical structures, bring information in the same line. To try to make this very clear, to make very clear what type of problem we're trying to deal with in the technological center, I brought this slide. So on the left side, que é o movimento de transformação movement, de... that's a fact that happens, digital transformation and globalization of the market interaction. So companies have been doing this for years. I'm gonna take the example from the previous presentation again, because they're also, a company, a power company, a national power company that's going through the same situation as many have been going through. And we know that there's an increase in the surface of attacks and this generates an increase in vulnerability. So there's no 100% secure system or solution. So on the one hand, we have the increase of the surface of attack and vulnerabilities. Um, in order to try to gain uh, more information. And on the other hand, we have a growing number of attacks to these critical infrastructures, a growth in the interest of several different types of actors, of malicious agents with several types of motivation from economic interest. That's perhaps the easiest one to understand the most Gente... straightforward one, but sometimes there's social political motivations in the world geopolitical game where cyber attacks against uh, critical infrastructures are also used. So considering these two sides, we have in the middle of this, we have the companies, generically companies who are the motor of the of economies and of all the different industries. Of course, I'm talking about companies that are part of the critical infrastructure. They need a reliable environment where they can, for example, assess the level of security or vulnerability of the infrastructure and do an assessment of this and test uh, solutions and recommendation that could be software, firmware, hardware, but essentially what they want as an environment is what they can do um, tests and assessments without compromising the operating system. It's very risky to do changes or modifications in the environment without compromising the environment. If you did compromise the environment, it wouldn't make any sense. It would be harmful and not uh, a benefit. So we created a center SA2 uh, for this. It, this is a center for advanced studies and strategic actions. It's part of our CTI. And its main goal is how to answer some of these questions of this scenario I just mentioned. If, as I said, this center is hosted here in the Itayapu Technological Center, but it's the fruit of a partnership of three uh, main actors that I need to mention. Itayapu National, initially, 
uh, o exército, and que é um grande parceiro. Que they é... fund a lot of this. They're also a client. There's the army, a uh, major partner working with us. This project began ahead its first steps in 2015. And AMIC is the military engineering institute. This represents the academia connected to us. Of course, we also have the academia here in this institution, but they've given us a lot of support very relevantly. So we have three major players who are relevant for this project, who are the body of this project, and who together with our team at the Technological Center have been able to produce solutions that I'll be talking about now. So I'm going to talk about two solutions, as was said. So one is called uh, the Simulated Network, ICS CADA. This is basically a RAM net, ICS CADA, it's already operational. It's been operational for over a year. And its goal is, well, we have a simulated network with some equipment with the goal of reflecting a network or a network architecture of a critical infrastructure of the power sector, uh, considering our clientele. So what is the goal of having an environment like this? We want to offer this. We want to offer this from ESCADA installed in the internet network so we can, can since we're susceptible to the uh, attacks of any malicious agents, uh, we'll be able to study them and see how they behave, what mechanisms, what strategies they use to attack this type of infrastructure. And by observing, we can learn, make recommendations, understand what vulnerabilities are most attacked, what are the mitigating, the risk mitigating potentials that would have a greater effect protecting against these malicious actors and offer this to our clients, to our interested clients in the projects, our partners. And here, uh, this is very simplified. It's an image trying to show uh, this topology we have, and that's already operational in our center. So it goes from the right to the left. On the right, we have the essential RAM SASSCADA, our, our network architecture. And what we have in blue uh, shows our intention to make a RAM net SCADA as similar as possible to a real network. So we included some physical uh, equipment. So we have a simulated virtual part and a physical part connected. So the system will be more realistic and the attacker can believe they're really entering a critical infrastructure and they can use all the strategies and mechanisms of attack. So we can understand these strategies and mechanisms better and do the best recommendations. The part in green is what we've had to create to monitor this uh, malicious behavior when they enter the architecture and start acting with their uh, procedures. Here, next, I have just an example to demonstrate that the blue part is reflected here in this rack, I opened the rack for demonstration. You can see that some of this equipment is generic. You'll find it in any infrastructure like the storage or the switch, but some of them like the IEDs, the protection, these are specific equipment in the uh, power sector, very common in substations, for example, we brought them, we connected them to the simulated network to make it more realistic, to make our simulation, our RAMnet more realistic. This is just for you to have an idea. 
And you can see that there are empty spaces. So depending on the interest of the client and what type of equipment they want to connect uh, to see how that will be explored, we can connect it to our RAMNET SCADA. We can bring in other equipment. Here are some of the results. So on the side, we have the dashboard where we can follow it in real time. This was created to show the evolution of the attacks, but essentially, initially, these are considered alerts. So we see here approximately 5,000 alerts there. It's natural, we need to understand that not all of these so the papel. attacks, cybersecurity attacks. So part of our role of our specialized technical team at the center is to create automated mechanisms using um, artificial intelligence techniques, for example, to filter these alerts into a subset which we hope will not be as big, that really has the potential of being a security event. And then we conduct analysis of these events case by case to understand all the morphology, how this happened, the strategy of the malicious agent. So we can see in essence, it's a simple file but it has a lot of added value. So in this file, in this document, we can reflect. It's still um, uh, in initial stages of development, but it shows the vulnerabilities that can be explored, the mechanisms used, the amount of attacks against each type of vulnerability. And this is an input. This is a raw input for the team to produce an operational report and then a managerial report that will be given to a client. And essentially it will not only show a picture of what's happening, the type of attacks, but our proposal is also to offer security recommendations that can support the client in decision making what types of mechanisms, uh, risk mitigation they can implement or adjustments they can make in their architecture to prevent attacks like this from happening. This was one of the solutions. I'll go to the second solution, which we call a cybersecurity laboratory. There's a picture of part of it. The idea, of these laboratories is a little bit different from the vision of the Ramnet CS CADA. Here we have a laboratory environment, a physical space with a logical physical infrastructure available so we can replicate an infrastructure of a company. In the power sector initially, so you can bring a replica of this infrastructure of the full architecture into the laboratory, put this into operation, and then you can do some tests and validation, very much related to the slide I showed about the needs of the companies. So I'm trying to give a very simple example, a simplistic example. I think it'll make it easier to understand. So you can bring all the architecture of a certain client into our lab. And as you'll see in the image, I'll show you later, we can do some simulations with other equipments that we connect to the lab. It's totally isolated. It's disconnected from the network. So we can do a simulation 
of the uh, client's environment and then include some type oh, of malicious agent of malware, for example, and how we can do some tests to see how that network will behave here. We understand that this is not the production environment. It's far from that. It may be a very close copy of the client's production environment. And this creates a lot more uh, security and tranquility for the client together with our specialists uh, to do some type nah. of simulation and feel comfortable with the changes they will make or propose in the uh, in operational infrastructure of their company. So this is similar to the previous um, item. And we can see a difference here. We can see the blue part here, each one has uh, something highlighted. So we have different laboratories, two modules in different places. One in Foz do Iguaçu at the IPTI, and the, one is, the other one is at IME, that's in Rio. The idea is for them to communicate so we can do simulations that involve two actors, two players communicating over the internet, which we know actually happens, at least in the power sector. So a uh, laboratory, as you can see here, has the capacity to offering clients the possibility of simulating basically all the different tiers in their network architecture. I have an example here. So we're able to what type of equipment are we able to connect? At the higher level, it's very probable that we'll have a lot of virtualization that's a lot closer to the business tier. And in the lower level, we can have equipments connected. Item five, for example, I, PNCs, GPS, these are equipments that are commonly connected that we can connect and do a simulation using what we're use, showing is item six here, which is a digital simulator. Que, é, é o equipamento de simulação que vai nos trazer. Which I would say is the simulation equipment that will bring us the equipment as close to reality that we can have when we talk about um, high potency power systems. So this is certainly a very good asset for power companies to simulate part of the process as wished. In this case, aimed at cybersecurity. So this is similar to what we had before. So this is the RTDS. This is a rack. It's an equipment for information processing. And we have another rack open here uh, to show you an image where we can include the client's equipment so they can be part of the simulation in the lab. So we bring this concept of the look, but that's a very important concept. The idea is that we can bring these equipments in and the, some of them are very easy to transport so we can bring them to the lab and test them with the specialists. So what are the main outcomes that we've had since the beginning of this process that's been maturing year by year with our team? So, when I work with cybersecurity, as one of the things we can list is that we have a body of workers, a personnel that is very well trained in cybersecurity, in mathematics, and automation technology. We have a lab installed that is ready to be used. We have training and sensitization in information security. That's another one of our actions that was documented in the previous presentation, the participation of PTI, also uh, supporting our partner company, Jaipu Binasupal. We do this for their technological center. Other companies in that technological center were available for other companies outside of that center too. We use tools for cyber 
intelligence so we can implement and create tools that are important for better results and support in the situational awareness that's very relevant for us in the Itaipu area since we work with them so closely. So as conclusions, I think it's clear this scenario today is very complex, very challenging. We always have threats on one side and mechanisms for protection on the other hand, and we have to deal with this. I dare say that we're on the side of protection, so we're always looking for protection mechanisms can um, make new attacks um, impossible or protect us uh, in our different vulnerabilities. So I think as was very well said before, we work with awareness people, with uh, people, some of the results of that were talked about. We work with processes in cybersecurity and technologies, which is very much of what we bring as a technological center, offering solutions to respond to the needs of companies of our clients. So we can see the need not only for uh, solutions, but actions that can help uh, critical infrastructure companies to reduce the vulnerability and their exposure to these malicious agents and become more secure. That's what we want, more resilient uh, companies and critical infrastructure. And we can help with our solutions, with our center, which as I said, can offer technical consultancies, case studies, test simulation, using our infrastructure, we can demonstrate cyber events. We know, for example, about a cybernetic event that took place in a company, we can replicate it in our lab to analyze the anatomy of the event and see how it behaved, what could have been done, what type of mitigation or control could have been used for the result to have been uh, different or better? For example, so we uh, develop analytical reports of attacks. We have a very specialized team here together with our partners. The Brazilian Army is one of our partners that helps us a lot in these actions. And we're able to um, support our clients with the challenges that are brought to us. That's basically it. That's my contact information. I'm available for any questions that might come up. Thank you very much again in name of the Taipu Technological Center. And um, thank you very much for being here in this 12th colloquium. Thank you, Mr. Rafael Deitos for your presentation in the 12th colloquium. We remind you that the questions should be sent via chat box and they will be forwarded to the lecturers. After we respond them, we will make them available on the website, www.gov.br slash CTIR. So the third presentation will also be linked to the energy sector. It will be presented by Mr. Rodrigo Andrade Pereira Rosa, representing Petrobras. The title of his presentation will be Cybernetic Management from the Shaft to the Office. I will pass on the floor to Mr. Rosa right now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Rodrigo Rosa. I am the manager for um, cybersecurity and defense in Petrobras. Today, I would like to thank you for the invitation to, to be part of this colloquium in such a high level with excellent presentations. And now let's speak a little bit more about the, the matter of uh, cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. I would like to start by mentioning 
our agenda, the global context, who are we, and a little bit of our history, uh, the program for cybersecurity at Petrobras, and then some conclusions. Regarding the global context, we have had a few revolution eras in terms of uh, uh, industrial eras in a few waves. So first we had the mechanization, the first steam machines, and then we have the, we had the fourth industrial revolution that is today the cyber physical systems where new technologies such as AI and cloud computing, machine learning, and uh, the amount of sensors and, and big data are absurd and all of that generates some converging networks between ot and it so this is the future we have no way of escaping it and the uh and petrobras has looking for a digital journey for uh, increasing in order to increase our flexibility and decision making and op optimization this gives us a possibility of decision making in real time and the use of many processes in order to bring um, digital uh, digital uh, tweets and also the uh, power plants that are digital, a duplicate of the real one, just like a, a, an actual industrial power plant with all of the controls and processes and technologies in order to be uh, digitally operated and remotely operated. And of course, all of those benefits have a cost and this cost is to deal with uh, many um, threats and cyber risks that's not that's not me only my, only me that that says that we we also have some uh, reports of the world economic forum the global risks reports of the of 2021 we have a few risks here and cybersecurity failure risk is one of the risks that have been uh with the higher score in this table here we have the sixth the seventh position here which are um, understood to happen since the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, to speak a little bit about this beginning of the pandemic, when in fact we had the uh, intensification of the uh, scenario of global cyber, cyber cybernetic threats, we had this timeline of many attacks that happened with many companies and many uh, areas where we have in orange, we have this the attacks that potentially caused some kind of damage or impact in industrial power plants. So specifically in our sector, we have the uh, pipeline, uh, colonial pipeline uh, case that has been uh, a huge impact in the USA, a billionaire damage, so uh, a damage of billions. So this, is, uh, this was a red flag for many critical infrastructures. This is, uh, we have done a, a very specific work reproducing that in order to, to take the countermeasures that would be necessary to manage and deal with this and, and tackle this problem. Speaking a little bit about how we are structured in Petrobras, we have, I am the head of this, uh, the chair of the cybersecurity area. We have a few areas of uh, Intel and Center for Responses to Incidents which is very robust. We also have the affiliation with FIRST, which uh, is a very, very strong area of safety and industrial automation. I will detail a little bit more about this uh, program. You also have the prospection and technological architecture, the safe development, and also digital forensics. We also have the uh, identity and data protection part, which is very important for our environments and also the risk management area, uh, conformity uh, agreements, and also uh, information security risks management, and also the governance uh, security information, which is, uh, we have the uh, security awareness and the part of uh, making people aware of that and training personnel in order to, to take care of these indicators of uh, information safety. Some of our history in 2018, we had the benchmarking with many groups, many in, many companies of for oil and gas. This was uh, we have the uh, GBG, the uh, oil and gas benchmarking group, analyzing many of the companies in, in, around the globe, uh, evaluating the the frame of each company, and that's something that 
was applied to our critical controls and processes. It was a uh, uh, self-declaratory assessment. And we understood that we had a lower maturity than we wished that we had. And with that maturity that was below the what we wanted to have, we needed to implement a program that was the uh, cybersecurity program where we would evaluate and assess our power plants with the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. I don't know if you all are aware of this, but this is divided in five uh, main dimensions. So we have identification, protection, detection, response, and recovery. And within each one of those subdomains, we, we have a, a set of uh, requirements to, to uh, deal with these statements and elevate our level of maturity. So we started with the identification part, especially the part of uh, managing the assets and automation of assets, speaking about the process of uh, identification of those assets. And the whole framework has very important actions that we were, and we were more or less in this situation of uh, uh, having a low level, a uh, reasonable level of identification, but uh, a lack of security and the strategy for security program. So it, we started to carry out the, the program in with using NIST in Washington, and then we started to understand and assess a little bit closer of, you know, how this could be applied within the industrial environment. And then we uh, reached the conclusion for some actions in our program. So the first one in the first domain would be to establish a governance between cyber defense, the area of IT, and then the business areas. The, uh, the plants would always be very much regional and the business areas would defend their independence in terms of administration. So they have always been almost like a, a, a silo feudal system um, where the security areas would be very, uh, would have a very hard time entering and, and establishing themselves. So we had to establish governance between those areas. We created a commission for automation and safety responding directly to the board of the company. So this is very important to have that commission with the power to, to, to give visibility to the uh, heads who can understand the decisions and make them fit the risk appetite of the organiz or organization. So we established the whole uh, set of patterns and policies for the, the organization. We started a inventory of all our assets in order to uh, assess risk in real time. And for that, we had the necessity of acquiring a few technologies that we followed with in terms of protection, hiring uh, training and creating PADs for our entire task forces, a uh, workforce uh, with some implementation in the industrial power plants. Both operators and also people working in the administration will have some kind of interaction with the industrial power plants and their automation. We reestablished the whole process of managing uh, uh, those environments, we re-adequated all of the digital areas that had access to the intra to the uh, internal network for cooperation and automation using the IPS uh, system. And we created a new projects to implement firewalls, uh, next generation firewalls. Uh, we used many new functionalities such as uh, crypt, uh, a package for, for uh, encryption that would be used throughout the network and the acquisition of those products of firewalls and, and encryption would be very important to use those packages in real time and to understand, in fact, if we had some kind of anomaly or, or threat that would come into those um, services DMZ. So uh, remote access to would be not standardized and we did standardize with the solution for the whole remote uh, access and control in these environments due to this uh, hybrid environment of work due to the pandemic. And also we established 
a last factor for uh, authentication in all of those environments. And of course, that would strengthen a lot of those controls for access and profiles and segmentation of the environments. In the field of detection, we created a process for detection of intrusion of malware, malware and vulnerabilities, seeking uh, vulnerabilities in all elements and also monitoring all of the uh, risk elements in the network. So we created two, uh, we also created a uh, lake, a data lake, uh, creating all of those, bringing all of those events of security, linking uh, many safety platforms, bringing those events and that history to establish a environment for data prediction for the uh, industrial environment. We also created a orchestration, a tool for a firewall orchestration, orchestration so that we could establish a governance of the uh, firewall rules in order to equalize the whole environment and bringing together all of the levels of risks and uh, firewall of those environments. For response, as I told you, uh, we have a uh, incident response center, which is a very mature team. Um, we had a very severe process in order to join first. And we also uh, followed the uh, Denisa framework when we also established the uh, report for safety alert in the entire business area. So it's very important to link the work of the uh, response teams with the business areas, trying to speak their language and trying to bring the uh, risk reports for into a language that the public would be able to understand. It's no use speaking about only patches and um, a level of vulnerability, a score of CVS, and that doesn't speak the language of the, uh, the whole team. So we have to be very clear and translate that risk into a practical consequence into the uh, for the uh, automation plan. So this process of incident response was not the trivial process. It was the whole teams, uh, all of the teams would have some autonomy, but in order to, to enter that environment for automation, you have to review the materials so you can make decisions together with the specialists and the, the engineers. So that should be reviewed. The intelligence against threats part uh, has a, a network for collaboration. I'll speak more about that later you should be one step uh, in front of that threat because you have to uh, bring that into the business area. And we establish many partnerships with many uh, entities to create a network collaboration, a, col a collaboration network uh, for that. The uh, tests for penetrations have, we have been working with some labs that we created with some simulated environments and we have some tools for simulations that are able to inject packages into the network and uh, we can create some simulations of uh, breaching and analysis of attacks so basically we, we would simulate an attack and create some packages for uh, malware in all tools bringing uh, them throughout the system trying to understand how the defense would react to this kind of threat um, of course, that would be a controlled threat, and it's uh, only with a, a drop of the package, package of the malware, malware and not the mal malware itself. And in recovery, we, it's very important to, to carry out some simulations. More important than having your resilience, the tools and everything readily available to respond to an incident, it's important to simulate the interactions so that the people in the teams have the... Uh, awareness of how they have to act and respond so that everyone knows their role within that process and how that information will run within the company. So the simulations have that role of detection with the technicians, the specialists for the center of response to incidents up to the levels of management and even the board of the company. Speaking, of course, in uh, a, a given level in order to bring them information according to the to their own decision level uh, for their situations. Of course, uh, we have also a backup, which is uh, a backup, which is a very important front and also a disaster rec recovery plan due to the impact of business. It should be very well done and very well tested. 
I'll speak a little bit about the government governance of this program. As I spoke before, uh, our members for the whole uh, ICT part and the uh, business areas have their contributions with the business plans. We are in the third wave of the program and we had a uh, uh, strategic, strategic report for the uh, board uh, every, every quarter and we would have monthly meetings in order to have operational uh, exchange. Uh, they, they, we have a sprint system in order to, to use uh, agile methodologies uh, to have that program going. And we also have the scope of uh, the, the uh, platforms that we have for all of our energy power plants. And I'll speak a little bit about the process of uh, awareness. We do need a lot of contact with people, processes, and technologies where the person, the personnel is the weakest link. So it was necessary to execute some training and carry out some uh, training, extensive training with the entire workforce. Everybody has been trained to understand that the system for automation are vulnerable. They are systems that have been built with physical equipments that should resist conditions for uh, extremely critical conditions for operations, such as trepidation, high temperatures and pressures, um, dust, vibrations, and so on. So those are very robust environments, and the machines will be working for a long while. But the whole technological part and the software part and that gives support to the hardware, we understand that has doesn't have that resilience and longevity. So bringing that concept to the workforce was very important, and it is very important to do that with all of those campaigns. And due to that fragility and vulnerability, the systems for industrial automations are very, uh, they are something that can generate some irreversible damages to the operations. And when we speak about critical infrastructure, they can even create damage to the country and to society. So this is uh, the uh, training campaigns have been done massively in order to train the entire workforce. And I'll speak a little bit about the risk assessment. Um, it's very important to prioritize and have a risk analysis that is well done and, and well conducted in order to have each one of the assets in priority and their activities related to their assets also in, prior, in order of priority. So what do we need to do that? What is the next biggest challenge for us to get in, in there? Visibility. So visibility is the key word here. We need to have a dynamic visibility and not a manual visibility. We have to have visibility of all of those elements you have here in the right hand side. I have many different uh, components here. Of course, we have the uh, PLCs or uh, network flows, the SCADA service protocols, and also the uh, historians, of course, of all, of all of those automation regions. So. We have to have visibility of that and we sought some passive monitoring technology in order to get into those environments to, in, to input some sensors in them in order to have real-time data and our team should be analyzing that and for in order to do that we have to train people to operate that technology and understand those protocols in a very specific level in order to understand the two what is the false positive in the tool? Because the tool, of course, will help. The uh, AI will detect stand, uh, patterns and those patterns should be uh, mapped and we, the team would understand all of those uh, flows. And it is very important to have the visibility of the environment. So it's very, uh, it's crucial to have programs in order to detect those um, assets and those components within the network. That was a paramount part of the, uh, a very fundamental part of our program. Uh, carry on here. You have to understand also where you have the vulnerabilities and weaknesses. It is very important to uh, understand that those vulnerabilities for IT and OT should be mapped. We have many repositories 
and servicing these uh, vulnerabilities. We can find information that is very precise and very useful about the vulnerabilities of those environments. So we know where we have vulnerabilities and uh, we have systems for control uh, of those vulnerabilities with our threat system, threat detection system, with our uh, partners to understand the areas themselves and the networks and their vulnerabilities and also applying corrections to our uh, on our side. So this is very important to us to bring the intelligence against threat also so that we could uh, do that automatically. Not it doesn't make any sense to not apply that automatically because it should be happening uh, at once automatically. You shouldn't be alone. Uh, the attackers can also collaborate nowadays. They collaborate uh, throughout many networks. It would be very naive to think that that doesn't happen in that level. So you have to collaborate with your partners as well. So thinking about that, we created this uh, network that counts now with more than 50 companies. We were, we have uh, Setir and Word with us. We have Cert PR Itaipu also takes part of that uh, team for the, that network for information exchange. And we have uh, MISP as the central element uh, of that network. And we receive information and exchange and apply knowledge and that intelligence um, individually in our firewalls and also within our own endpoints in the telemetric tools and anti-malware uh, tools. So it's very important to automatize and integrate that due to the volume of events that we have. It's impossible to deal uh, with all of that in that level, in that scale manually. So in order to make it worth, uh, we created some uh, workshops in order to integrate those uh, teams. We created the MISP startup and uh, we had a kit for installment and so that the companies and the participants could uh, enter and share those events and they might have some easier way of doing that. So we had some integration workshops too in order to bring those events with the MISP and apply those defenses automatically, both in the borders and also in the endpoints. So uh, we have a very important scale here. If we understand that each one of those companies have some uh, distinct tools and endpoints, it is as if uh, instead of going to the doctor, you would go to a, uh, a medical board in order to have a bunch of algorithms and distinct tools in order to detect some problems. So uh, also talking about uh, celerity you know uh, if you have an attack in one company the other companies shouldn't go through that so collaborations are key and last year we have some conferences uh, we have a, a conference a the ckn conference in order to share and collaborate with the entire uh, framework of intelligence against threats both corporate and cybernetic threats and in the network for industrial automation i'll speak a little bit also about our uh, incident response team. Uh, it is very important to have them completely integrated with their processes, both for industrial automation, in our cases, in the, in the refineries and platforms and ships. All of the business areas have close contact with the team. Uh, all of the flows are very well mapped and the roles within those teams are also very uh, specific and very uh, important you should have the specialist in threat hunting looking for threats and with no pressure of uh, delivery but only seeking and and looking for uh, threats we use that a lot we train a lot with many uh, market certifications with our specialists uh, the blue team and red team role within the system is also very important so that the uh, exercises of simulations and cybersecurity uh, attack simulations can happen with the specialists in using the cloud and in the level of industrial automation. That makes a huge difference. And of course, we also have now, uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. So as I said before, we had a data link up collecting data from many sensors and many tools 
in our ecosystem, generating some uh, operational indicators that would measure how much each one of my security barriers is able to uh, hold during a threat according to a level of conformity of each one of those barriers in order to to bring that visibility that we uh, acquired in our environment. So all of the security program is fed by those indicators and the indicators will bring the actual view of view of the environment. And this is done with the analysis uh, with of the indicators and figures. And we bring that to the commission of uh, uh, automation security and, and safety. So that is going to the board of the company and the, the uh, the chairs in order to understand what happens in terms of uh, risk and their appetite for risk. And I will uh, follow to the conclusion, we need to choose a framework. Um, it is very important to have a framework and to, to carry out the work of adequating the framework to your reality is not something that you should do isolated. It should be done uh, in groups, the operation, the IT and telecom operations should be involved. The security areas should lead that work with their view of security and with their view of the controls of the framework that, that would make sense to protect the assets. And the business areas should, be, should bring the business view and the knowledge that they have of the industrial automation. And you have to execute the, to carry out the assessment and analyze risk and this should be this assessment should be transparent direct and very uh, comprehensive in order to identify all of your gaps and your points of failure so this is very important to understand your weaknesses and to know where your critical points lie so that you can prioritize and with the act assets in priority order you can focus your effort in what matters the most so this will define your strategy for action and this strategy should be very well uh, uh, translated to the all to the, to all of the levels of the companies with the governance as well. So in, in order to do that, you have to create your security program for uh, industrial automation and uh, incident response. It should be very close to the business itself. It, the business should be taking part in that and they should communicate very well. And we can start small. Um, in terms of delivery, you should be consistent with your deliveries. You should go one step at a time. It is a journey. It is a matter of maturity. You go from one level to the other. And uh, in, a, in, the, in the NIST framework, it, it shows very clearly each one of the levels, how you tackle each one of the prerequisites in order to elevate your maturity. And then you reach your goals um, asset by asset. Every day we have a new challenge. It is an area that needs investment all the time. It needs a lot of research and collaboration, right? So this program helps us a lot. It is it brings visibility to the board and the context, a global context of threats and uh, uh, security. So the program defends the company. The program itself justifies the whole effort which is not small, you know, it's a, it is very necessary to have investment of resources, financial resources, and also uh, human resources that are very important to, to carry out that program and take it off the paper and put it into action. And also the need to collaborate with other companies. We shouldn't be alone. Um, we have a few ways of collaborations, a few forums for uh, collaborations without compromising any kind of industrial secret or architecture. We can collaborate with only the data from the threat itself. It makes a huge difference in response. So this was my presentation. I will leave you with my uh, email address and phone number. And I thank you for the opportunity of being here. If any company has any interest in taking part in our uh, sharing network, you have my contact information here. You can get in touch with me directly and I will direct you to my team so that we can analyze and then we can exchange information and cyber intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rodrigo Rosa for your presentation and in our 12th colloquium. 
I inform you all that the questions should be forwarded in the chat box and they will be sent to the lecturers. After they answer those questions, the answers will be made available in the website www.gov.br slash CTIR. We have no doubt that we live in a world that is more and more digitalized. So the services, the public government services cannot be an exception to that, which make them, which makes them fundamental to society. The Secretariat for Digital Government has as its mission transforming the government using the digital, trans promoting effectiveness of policies, quality of services, and reacquiring the trust of Brazilians. The fourth and last presentation uh, for today will be given by Mr. Leonardo Ferreira, representing the Secretariat for Digital Governance, SDG. Mr. Leonardo will present us with the, the program of privacy and safety and information safety, PPSI, which is made of a set of actions and uh, adaptations in the areas of privacy and information safety developed within the scope of the disciplines of governance, personnel, methodologies, technologies, and management of maturity. I will pass on the floor to Mr. Leonardo Ferreira. Good morning, can you all hear me? Is my image okay? Ouvindo bem aqui, é... I can hear you well here. Yes, we can hear you well. So, good morning, everyone. So, a, a brief introduction has been made. I think it's more productive for me to go ahead and start the slides, and then we can talk. It's more of a conversation in the uh, idea of a colloquium. So can you see uh, the presentation? It's PPSI. Can someone give me an OK to make sure? So good morning to everyone. My name is Leonardo Ferreira. I'm the Director of Privacy of Information Security from the Department of uh, Digital information of the Ministry of the Economy. And I'd like to thank City Hub for the invitation to for the opportunity to be here. It's an honor. We have a long-term partnership with them. So this is just one more opportunity, a continuation of this work. So Thank you very much. I'd also like to congratulate GSI for their recent integration in FIRST. This is excellent work that's being done by the Institutional Security Office and its collaborators. So the idea is to talk a little bit about the program on privacy of information security. You might be asking why the Department of Digital Information is next to giants like Itaipu Binational and Petrobras, who spoke here today. I'd like to congratulate the speakers. You have very interesting um, contributions. And our department, why is our department here? It's because we see ourselves and we've built ourselves, as the GSI folks just said, as a government critical infrastructure. So government is becoming digital. It's transforming by digital um, things. And we're, we realize that we're part of this. I have some 
important information from my department of digital government. Uh, this is our uh, March information. We're closing our April information now, but he, when we talk about the ID Gov uh, tool, governmental tool to access public services. We already have approximately 130 million users. We have more than 30,000 uh, public services that are totally digital. So in this government, we've been moving ahead with this a lot. We have more than 36 million uh, secure accounts. For example, in the application of the central bank, I'm sure many of you use this. We have a single um, homepage. So these numbers are to justify our infrastructure of uh, digital government. So today our digital de department um, brings together 235 different bodies, universities, the Ministry of Education, federal revenue, federal treasure. So we are the conductors of this orchestra, so to speak. Those who are responsible for information security have very clear role. The National Authority of Data Protection has a very important role connected to the law 3709. And we have a very clear policy of information security and GSI is very clearly the manager of this policy. The point is that we have an area of action uh, where we have 235 bodies and we do this orchestration. And we see that this critical infrastructure just tends to grow. When we look at this number, a web uh, channel with almost 350 million accesses, more than 250 million downloads in our app stores uh, of the GovBR app. So this is the infrastructure that we have to protect. So we, we come from a very vigorous, strong movement in this strong uh, pandemic movement and uh, we've transformed digitally we won't go back to what we were before the pandemic so our area of attack our digital border our digital frontier has increased a lot as one of the colleagues said many of our workers work from home we use vpns with all the challenges we know so this is this is to bring us this idea. Why do we see ourselves as a critical infrastructure? This is a recent movement. We have security actions being implemented since 2019, an LGDP uh, adaptation program. And a few months ago, we uh, started the PPSI program. It was 120 days last Sunday. We're very happy about this. It's a journey, as a colleague said, and we're very happy about all our little victories in this. I know I'm talking to many colleagues here, to security professionals who work on this on a daily basis. So I'm giving you some very recent examples of security incidents from some private organizations. All of them you know about them, JBS, Submarino, Renner. It's a huge list. And I didn't put any uh, governmental bodies here, but they occur with the state, municipal, and federal public bodies. There are many. We work with uh, CTI very closely, and we see that it's very common to receive uh, reports of problems from these 235 different governmental organizations. So I'm just bringing this for reflection, for us to reflect about the scenario. For example, we could have a vision that may be in public organization that have stricter budgets. There might be larger attack areas, but we look at the private world and large organizations like some organizations I brought here. We look at world-class organizations going through a security incidents with huge um, losses, uh, leaks, uh, functional data uh, it, within the US regulations like the CCPA and so on. So what's the value of public policy? 
what is our appetite for risk? Are we willing to take this on? Because many times I see in public policies, it's difficult to quantify, but there's a cost for citizens, for more than 200 million uh, Brazilians, the 130 million using our critical infrastructure, our gov.br, uh, so we need to protect them. And we're very much concerned with this now. There are several different tiers. We work with concepts like deep defense. We have many segments. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit. And there's an issue. This data are a real concern in Brazil and in the world. Is this something that only we who are professionals of privacy and information security are concerned about? We suspect everything because we work on this on a daily basis. We were about issues of security and privacy. No, it's not just our concern. This is a worldwide concern. This study from Gardner is from January and February of this year. And these executives were asked, almost 2,500 executives throughout the world, what was their uh, disposition to invest in technology? So you can see there's a very strong movement. Uh, green here is in uh, green. Uh, these are those who invest in artificial intelligence. And in the world, we have 57%. We also have the Tem um Brasil com 60... uh, data science part here for making better decisions. 61% in Brazil and 57% in the world. And I'd like to call attention to this uh, recent data. This research was done in Brazil. We were able to participate. Uh, cybersecurity and information security, 72% of Brazilian public and private organization have uh, shown that they are going uh, to use some of their resources uh, to improve their capability in cybersecurity and information security, maybe through training. There are some more categories here too, but I'd like to point this out. But I, why 57% in the world? Because they've been doing this for a long time. Because when we look to Brazil and we look to other countries, there's already uh, previous regulation in other countries, GDPS in Europe, CCPA in California, several regulations. So these recommendations already exist, they're already in place. So countries like us are now adapting, it creates this need. So I've shown you that there's a movement to increase investments and how does the Department of the Digital Government see this? We have many responsibilities. One of them is to defend and protect the data this digital university, the data of the Brazilian people who are under our protection. So as I said, we've been working since 2019 with the LGPD Guide for Action. We've been acknowledged for this work recently. We've received an award. We'll re receive it actually uh, tomorrow at SEPRO in the Earth Privacy and information security, recognizing the pioneering and the effort to um, adequate us to adapt as 12 GPD. So since last year, we've been working very vigorously to introduce these elements of information security. So today we have available on our website of the Secretariat of Digital Governance 15, um, different uh, guidebooks for different realities in cybersecurity. And uh, as one of our colleagues said, we need to elect a framework. The framework we use is CIS-8. We have some references connected to UNIST too. It's also very common to talk about UNIST functions. They're very palatable. They're very easy for people from other sectors like business people to understand. And so we create the program for security of information. Uh, I'll talk about that briefly. I want to talk more about the critical infrastructure. Our goal was to increase maturity and resilience for privacy and 
information security of 235 governmental bodies that are involved. This is a huge um, amount of bodies. They have different levels of maturity. So uh, in the first way, we are working with a set of bodies that we consider critical for our digital government department. And we have some that have uh, what we call key results. These are central bodies where we have to implement controls very quickly uh, to respond to legislation and norms from several different control organizations. And also to include what we call essential controls. I like what our colleague said about a journey. The having this vision of taking steps and delivering consistently. We have to deliver all the time and feel that time is passing and I'm increasing my level of maturity. And we focused on a set of essential controls. Since it's a, the challenge was a brief, very focused um, presentation, I focused on some of our initiatives in our program. How is our program structured? We have five different programs that are five different tiers. We focus on governance. One of the areas we focus on is governance, technology, people, processes, technology and maturity. So we have two towers, these lines of defense of governance and maturity, which is where I establish a governance structure within these bodies, the people are there. I'll give you an example. The topic of privacy and uh, information security. For example, in the Ministry of Economic Information, or any of these 235 governmental bodies, there are five different managers who discuss this. First is the high administration. Usually they're sensitized. Usually the head of that body knows about the importance of this program. We also get in touch with the internal controller who's responsible for compliance, the person responsible for data management, and the security manager and the IT managers. So we have this governance structure that has to be responsible because at the end of the day, the risks for privacy and information security are risks to the integrity, risks to compliance, and they have to be dealt with. In the same way, as the structure is mobilized, we can have uh, management, uh, maturity management. So we have a ranking of the degrees of maturity among the different bodies. So I can see gaps and work in a very straightforward and quick way. So we have a set of actions. I'll talk about one. The first big initiative, which is very much aligned to this colloquium and this information from GSA, which is their information from our C-Search the idea of an integrated cybersecurity center in the digital government to do this uh, connection with Regique. For example, as Petro Braz said, there was a network here where several organizations in the public and private sector were integrating. So we have this idea of coordinating this sector. We have a very clear role in relation to these 235 bodies. And here we have uh, phishing simulation tests for these bodies. They're already quite advanced. We have a list of volunteers with the uh, degrees of maturity and resilience of these events. Training and events, we had a very big training event this year. I'll invite you to the next one. A framework, for example, one of the colleagues talked about adopting a framework. They adopt NIST. We're creating our own free, uh, our own network. And in our maturity towers, we've been having regular meetings every day at the end of the day. I have fulfilled my mission if I've gotten in touch with at least one of these bodies. So Monday through Friday and sometimes, unfortunately, on the weekend, 
we are talking to these bodies. I had one yesterday, I'll have another tomorrow and Friday. The program has to be alive all the time. I have to take this to the different bodies and collaborate and talk to them. So we had to establish a minimum standard until we had agreed on this framework with everybody. So we uh, created what we call uh, basic essential quality control. And based on a work plan, we created five different subjects related to, to body, aligned with bodies like CGU, TCU, GSI. So the idea was to do what was basic with excellence. So all the bodies in our digital infrastructures are concerned with establishing at least these five controls. Implementing backups is the first policy we consider essential. This has to be very clear for the bodies. Besides the policy, we have to have this good practice in place. Management, why? Because, of, for example, hands and attacks are very aggressive where data is cryptographed ransoms are asked for, we don't pay ransoms, we don't negotiate with criminals, so we have to weigh of reestablishing our operation very quickly and with quality, so I have to have a vision. So the first policy is backup. Uh, another concern of ours is managing access control, the issue of vectors, how people uh, can manage an incident, a handsome mix event, for example, what vectors are using a phishing campaign, who has access, what is the policy of minimum privileges, MFA, second factor, so we're concerned with the bodies, with managing access control, who has access to my networks, then we have management, a strong process of vulnerability management to be very much connected to access control, and uh, vulnerability management in the perspective of, of dating hardware, software, uh, updating patches, the work of GSA, beautiful work, uh, sharing alerts and recommendations all the time we have this work. So you can see that these controls are already implemented or in a phase of improving. One of these 235 bodies in this wave, we focus on restricted groups, inventories of actives, how can you control what you don't know you have? So hardware and software has to be in an inventory and need to know who is connected to my network, even to manage vulnerabilities base. and to manage access control. This seems, these things seem very initial, but when we look at incidents in the private world and public bodies in the third sector, many times we see that these uh, five subject areas were neglected. So we understand we need to reinforce these five. This is our vision of our government. And the fifth one is after an incident, I have to preserve the logs. I have to send logs to the federal police, to GSI and so on. So I have to have a centralized management of logs, many times supported by tools. I have to preserve the post-mortem there. What happened in those uh, security systems? What's the modus operandi of that attacker? How did that happen? So we focus a lot on these disciplines. Uh, this is what we're uh, focused on. Uh, besides the regulations, I'll give an example of conformity control. We have a person responsible for uh, data protection at, the, at Petrobras or the ministry, different ministries. So it's very important to have this vision. Also, I'm going to talk, so I talked about our monitoring. Uh, that's what we look at all the time and we're planning other controls and perfecting them. We did uh, our first week of cybersecurity of the federal government. It was February 14 to 18. It was wonderful. GSI was there, federal police was there, uh, private companies, specialists in security gave talks, talked about their tools, their approaches, their security uh, strategies. So we focused a lot on cybersecurity. We had many um different areas we didn't record it we had many sensitive topics more than 35 hours of immersion with hands-on activities 
We did a pen test in real time with virtual machines showing the dynamics of the attack, some possible defenses. And it was very interesting in the same line, we have next week designed for May 23rd to 27th about uh, personal data protection. So I'm bringing you CyberGov. This included our, uh, partners like Serpro, Dataprev, NPD gave a talk, GSI, um, federal police, our partners in the government who are very much aligned with us and while we were orchestrating all of this. So as uh, one of the colleagues said, he said we need to adapt the framework to our reality, to our context. It makes a lot of sense to us because we're designing our framework. Uh, the different bodies like TCU, GSI and others are aware of this. I have a private company who is um, reviewing this framework with us. And basically we include security controls and privacy controls. Uh, our other colleague talked about SIS-8. We have an authorized uh, translation of SIS-8 to Portuguese in our SGD website. It's a reference that all the different bodies use. Feel free to use that. It's totally open to the private companies too. And we're focusing very much on the functions of NIST. Our main uh, activity is implementing these controls. We can only talk about information security if I have controls in place. And more important than that is changing the culture in public and private companies so people can start breathing. This is an example. This convergence, we don't discuss these topics separately. Uh, sec security, information security and privacy. These are not separate. I can't assure privacy if I don't have security. I'll have leaks, uh, data from Brazilians will leaks, clients, uh, personal clients data will leak. If I don't implement a set of security measures, that's very basic. So in our point of view, we have to rework this theme jointly. Having said this, I'm moving on to a part that I think is very important and that I've been bringing you um, in the, what we call the Tower of People. It's something we're designing right now. This is a collaboration with the International Development Bank. We probably have the representative here. This is specifically for cybersecurity and privacy. And SGD, our department, we've been working to create a excellency center in cybersecurity. What does that mean? It means bringing together all these partners like Petrobras showed, just as CityGov does this integration, bringing partners, academia, private partners, we're talking about cooperation for good. And while well, Serbia and RNP, other centers already exist, they're very dedicated to specific segments. I'm working with these 235 bodies. I have to train people. I need to have a regular program. So we're counting on help. So together with these bodies and PPCI, we will take training and privacy and security, probably with uh, private partners, with a transparent contracting system, but we have to develop and perfect these capacities in our bodies. And if you're following this, this is going to be recorded, but between the 23rd and the 27th, we're going to use this same platform. It will also be transmitted through YouTube. So you can take advantage of this week to develop and foster discussions. We'll have the president of NPD, the directors of the NPD, giving a vision of public and private bodies talking about who's the controller, who's the operator, what's a joint controlling, what is a single control, what's the role of the operator? So 
deixar isso aqui. So we have this vision. I would like to mention this and invite you. I'll be uh, quick because we're running late. And so in this line of the technology tower, I spoke briefly about the uh, people tower. So now we're in the technology tower. We're in the final phase of our labs our pen tests, our internal team from SGD is training our team so we can start offering these services to governmental bodies. We have a list of volunteers and we're assessing their infrastructures in the same line, the structuring of phishing campaigns so we can apply them in the companies to see how sensitized collaborators are uh, to not click on the link. We have some strategies and approaches that are a lot of fun about how to map and sensitize this. But I think what's in vogue here and very much aligned is this constitution of a sectorial um, team, which we're calling the GovBR, the government the digital government. We're going to work with several partners. We're going to talk to all of you here, Petrobras, Itaipu. We're going to go around to these different places, Satir Gov. We need to talk to you guys. Satir Gov is our godfather holding our hand, saying we have to do this. Let's use first as a reference. Let's use Anisa for taxonomy. And in this line, and I'm briefly presenting a very um, high level vision of an initial vision. We have this uh, technical collaboration with the IDB, this line of financing. So when I talked in the beginning about this uh, critical infrastructure we have, it's already protected today. We have our strengths, our forts. I call them forts, Sapro, Dr. Prev, these Hi, big organizations in this area. But we who are in privacy and security, we know we're never 100% secure, we never will be. So we have to seek these synergies, events like this, like this colloquium. This is wonderful with the participation of Brazilians and people from all over the world. <coughs> So we're in a phase where we're looking for partners so we can structure this with this partnership. With IDB, we have a contact with them from May till uh, 2031. So we're really intent on growing in this cooperation and we're adjusting references for uh, this collaboration. So basically, by August 22, we want to have designed and implemented what we call the basic CCR to be our. There are many specialists here, and we know that when we look at a reference like Hard First, we see there's a framework, and sometimes it uh, turns more towards uh, coordination or more towards operation. So we're looking for identity, for work processes, training people who will be in the center. The way we're going to work, we're looking for support from CERT, CERTIGOV, KSM, and our team. And we're looking at these wonderful experiences of Itaipu, Petrobras, and other speakers who will be speaking till Friday. So this was very timely. And if you take a look, guys, in November, <coughs> we're not thinking of moving very fast. We want to have continuous deliveries, as our colleague said, but we also want something more structured. Where do I want to be in five years in this plan of action? So is the digital transformation of the Brazilian government going to move back? No, it tends to grow more and more. This axis tends to grow more and more. And we, since we have a central point, I have to protect this central point very much. And we're giving a response to society with PPSI and these 30, 235 bodies and the institution of this integrated center of cybersecurity. So this is a conclusion. I would like to leave our contact information for different organizations who want to get in touch, uh, private sector, 
partners, uh, sectors in the three different branches of government, municipal, state, and federal. Uh, we're open to partnership. I'd like to thank um, GSI for this very important event, this unique opportunity for us, because we start seeing ourselves as united in this sector in the context of Regi. I'd like to thank the teams from SGD, especially the Department of Information Security and Privacy, which has been doing wonderful work. And they really work hard. They really want to grow and learn. So I'm uh, available to all of you. Thank you very much, Augusto, General uh, Oliveira Freitas, for the invitation. Congratulations for your professionalism, your organization, the support team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Leonardo, for the presentation. Thank, thank you for your presentation in our 12th colloquium. I inform you all that the questions should be sent via chat box and they will be sent to the lecturers. Um, after they respond, they will be made available in the website www.gov.br slash CTIR. I should remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that our 12th colloquium CTIR Gov 2022 will follow until the 29th April of April next Friday always with the same schedule from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock p.m. Brazil time. And tomorrow we will have the presentation of international entities. The presentations, the international pre presentations will be provided in English and we will have simultaneous interpretation. Um, you can check your email for confirmation in your, of your participation in the event in and also in our website to see the instructions of how to set up the platform. For those of you who are watching the transmission using YouTube, in our website, you can also find two links available. One is with the original audio and the other one is with the interpretation audio. We now invite the director of the Department for Information Security of the Office for Institutional Security of the Presidency of, Republic, of the Republic, Mr. Marcelo Paiva Fontenelle to start with the closing of this first day of our 12th colloquium. Mr. Fontenelle, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We had the opportunity today of learning with the initiatives of Itaipu Binacional, with the foundation of the Technological Park of Itaipu, Petrobras, and also the Secretary of the Digital Government of the Ministry of the Economy. We also had the opportunity of seeing how the cybersecurity integrates not only the information assets through information technology, but also uh, telecom files and backup files. And also the technology of automation that is a, also, called, uh, also known as open operation technologies that will integrate control, automation, and operations. These are essential systems and they have been used in critical infrastructure and they require knowledge and specific data. And just like IT, we have to, we can conclude that information technology also and automa automation technology require investments and they include the continuous training of the professionals that deal with cybersecurity. I thank you uh, for your valuable contribution and for your participation. And I invite you to our second day of event tomorrow at the same time time and the same link. So with that, I close this first day of the Trump of CTIR 2022, and I wish you all a great week. Thank you.